Horace Phillips and I just had an article come out in Reconstruction, and it's called Spectacular Unhappiness, and it has an unwieldy something after the colon. But we sort of look at Facebook games in particular, and we use Sarah Ahmed's promise of happiness, and we sort of talk about how these games actually train people to play, quite quote unquote, Facebook, and how they're kind of they fit in together. There's this kind of sort of relationship where you have to accumulate as much friends and it's measured in, it's Candy Crush for example, it's measured in terms of this sort of competitive happiness where you can be either more sugary, more sh um, 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 yeah, just more sugary than your friends and you go through this kind of candy land type type thing and it's this kind of competitive thing and you're, you're evaluated on happiness and so that's what I think one of the big sort of intersections there is is that um, these games kind of um, they depend on platforms like Facebook is, or they did and they're now branching out through um, apps and, and things like that um, but they did at one point really depend on things like Facebook to get started and to reach a larger audience and, and um, so that's sort of one of the intersections I'm interested in. And speaking of um, sort of consumerist interests in the game industry, uh, social media games have become huge. Mm -hmm. um, In-app purchases, in-game purchases, becoming a, a a largely motivating profit factor for game developers now. Um, I think, on the one hand, it's it's become easier for me to talk about the social impact of games and the cultural impact mm -hmm. of games um, because more people, um, especially women, will identify as gamers because they've played social games. Um, so I think it's, it, on the one hand, it's brought more people into the game industry and, and helped people identify the role of play um, in, in their daily lives. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that because it comes with uh, such a, a motivation for, for profit, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an area we can um, game scholars should uh, should investigate. Um, I also think that with social games um, and, the, and and social media and gaming comes a, a a huge opportunity for game developers game developers to track play mm -hmm. play activities and um, uh, and so I think we need to be careful about what sorts of data we are sending uh, sending to game developers and to uh, and to corporate America. Um, and I think there's some some people um, like yourself who are doing that kind of work, looking at uh, non-disclosure agreements um, between uh, player communities and game developers. People are looking at uh, uh, privacy policies in terms of social games and uh, and social media and gaming. Okay. And those are some opportunities for further research. I think. And I'm kind of also interested in the way that these social games have redefined the landscape of of gaming, as Rylish was saying, but now that we don't always think about games as these triple-A, super photorealistic, $60 titles, we think about things as these browser-based, sometimes small things, which I think is one thing that I'm excited about as, a, as an educator who's interested in using games in virtual reality, is that we've kind of um, sort of refocused the emphasis of, of, of gaming and people's expectations of gaming more on the gameplay than on the sort of the pretty pictures and the, the photorealistic graphics and, and we've also packaged in these browser things which if anybody has taught games and had, has dealt with the oh well I can't play this game because I only have a Mac and it's not available for Macs well suddenly you have this whole like City of Steam is this MMO that's just sort of browser based now which is um, through the Unity engine but again that's what I'm kind of I'm also excited about how social games have really pushed the technologies of Flash and Silverlight and sort of stuff like that to do things that they weren't intended to do, and now they're opening sort of these these other avenues for maybe perhaps repurposing games for um, our own nefarious purposes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good point. I was just talking to uh, a conference member um, yesterday. And uh, he was asking what I studied, and I, of course, said, uh, you know, professional communication, uh, rhetoric, and, and computer game culture. And he said, well, I'm not a gamer. And I said, well, what, 
show me your phone. <laughs> and I asked him, uh, what, what, do you, what do you do with your phone? And it was mostly games. And so right there, we, but then we opened up a conversation of what does it mean to be a gamer? Mm -hmm. How much time do you have to spend every exactly. week to be a gamer? Uh, what kind of games do you have to play to be a gamer? Um, but Ken, has, Ken McAllister has this really great exercise where he starts, he starts in, a, in a big audience where he says, you know, how many of you consider yourself gamers? And of course, you know, I don't know, maybe 20% of the audience raises their hands. And then as he gets down to all of the levels of, of these different games and, and finally settles on solitaire on your Windows-based machine, and then everybody's raised their hand. Um, so I think, I think social media and games really do expose more people to to games um, and also expose more people to game development and um, to um, social tracking. <laughs>